Thank you very much, Brother Jeff, and good evening to everyone again, and welcome to our study session. 18 sessions and one a week, that, that takes us in about four and a half months of consistent see, being together and sharing the word and engaging each other. It has been a joy of mine, and it, it has been really a blessing being able to interact with you and to be able to share share the word something I enjoy doing very much as Robert indicated from my youthful days he said he said this young man I don't know if he was referring to the past or the present but I'm 66 heading hard for 67 so if he considers that young well I appreciate that very much um there's one of my songs that I, I love as I would classify as one of my favorites as well it says I love to serve my Jesus it's a privilege sublime. My life for fresh with beauty bright is sparkling all the time. With scenes that are unchanging, a rapture and a bliss. Transported, I am sworn in my Savior's righteousness. I love to serve my Jesus. He's all in all to me. He helps me bear each burden. He is my victory. So I engage in this as an act of service, an act of ministry, because I, I love to serve Christ all he has done in my life I, I appreciate his goodness, his blessing, his favor um, and all that I have been able to achieve through his goodness and his mercy and so I endeavor in whatever I do for him to give my best so that's why anytime I'm engaged in ministry I'm going to put my whole heart in it as, as we sing and do all he asks of me because I believe that that's the way we have to serve the Lord with commitment, with passion, and with zeal because God gave his best for us. I want to say appreciate the, the, the comments that you would have made, all of you. And I know everybody will not have gotten a chance to say something, but I know you would have valued our time together. I know there are some things that you may not be able to, to grasp in full understanding because it's a very intense study. And, and there are topics which have engaged many theologians, people in Bible seminary, people with degrees, have battled with understanding some of these biblical perspectives. And so there are differences across the board, even in, in some denominations, um, there are differences among individuals within respective denominations. So because of the, the, the type of language that has to be interpreted, in reference to a number of these study areas, we're going to get that. And as I said, we're not despising any person's perspective because a lot of people, even though they differ from our perspective in the Church of God Reformation movement, they are theologians, they are people who have studied, they are people who believe they will be led by the Spirit. And therefore, we have to appreciate um, their, their variants and their different opinions. And as we study the Word, you have to recognize that that is part of, of what is, is going to be the result. We're going to have different perspective because we're going to see things differently. We're going to interpret things differently. And sometimes we bring to bear on our whole interpretation, our background experiences, um, things that we were exposed to, and theological positions that have influenced our lives in, in relation to the groups that we are connected to. And so something is difficult to break away from your tra traditions and from your established teachings. And we are very often inclined to defend the position that we believe are the right ones. But I think we should approach the study of the word for open-mindedness because we want the Lord to be our teacher and we want him to guide us to an understanding of the word and not try to defend um, a particular position which we have been taught which has been established as part of our, our church culture because that's how we're going to get to the truth. I believe in, in a large measure that our particular perspective is a sound one and even though, as I said, it is a variation from the mainstream church, the mainstream evangelical groups uh, have a different perspective from the one we, we believe, but I believe that ours is sound that can be justified 
And even though it is it is different from the majority, and we might be in a minority when it comes to our theological perspective, I think we can feel confident and in our understanding of, of the word. And I hope that I have engaged you, as I have engaged you, sorry, that you will feel that confident in what we believe and what we proclaim as an understanding of these theological perspectives as, as we believe is taught in the word of God. I, I have a, a lot of confidence in, in our perspective and I believe it has a sound base from the word and that's what I was trying to show, to avoid opinion and try as much as possible to stick to the word. Yes, some of it needs interpretation and so we are going to still inter interject our, our personal understanding and our personal views, and we, and we must bear that in mind. And while we might believe that we are right, we cannot throw other people's um, ideas and positions through the window because, you know, a close examin examination could reveal that they might, might have um, a perspective that could also be justified based on how they view the scripture and how they interpret it. But in the final analysis, they said, there's one truth, and and we have to try as much as possible to get an understanding of that truth, and that's what I've been trying to do as I would engage you. Um, I know that that some of you would have found some of these things new, and so it's going to be difficult to understand and grasp all the concepts in their entirety. So I want you to keep reading. I have given you uh, some persons that are are sound expositors of the word. I hope you would have been making a list as I went through some of them in the sessions. There's one more I want to add, a, a person by the name of Bruce Gore, G-O-R-E. He is, is, is of the school of amillennialism, which is, is the, the, the theological perspective that we will share. And he is a very, very good expositor and a, 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 a good historian of, of, of scripture and he has some very sound teachings on even other areas than the ones we were discussing. So he's a good person that you could do some further um, connection with. There's a book that Brother John had loaned me when I had mentioned that I did not see a lot of writings um, on these topics by Church of God persons. And there's one he recommended called the symbols speak. And I found that this is a very, very good book and I will recommend it to you. I really enjoy reading it. So I want to say thank you, Brother John, for introducing me to this book. It's an exposition on the book of Revelation, but it will deal with a lot of the topics that we would have been, been looking at. And the, the author is Lily S. Makuchion. That's spelled M-C-C-U-T-C-H-E-O-N. So if you can get hold of, of that book, that is also a very good book. And it's, it's a book written from the Church of God Reformation perspective because the person writing the book is directly connected to, to our movement. So that's a book that I will recommend. So if you find difficulty in retaining all the information, that is understandable. But I hope you would have grasped the basic um, theology of the Church of God Reformation movement because I believe that if we are part of, a, of an organism, we have to have an understanding of its doctrinal positions. It does not necessarily mean that you would agree with everything that I would have projected um, based on our, our, our teachings. You have the right um, you know, to disagree or to have a variance of opinion based on your understanding of the word, but it is important that you understand where we are coming from in our teaching and the foundation and the basis for those teachings from the word. And as I indicated, that, that's what I've tried to do um, through these studies, to show you from the word um, and engage you as much as possible as to what the word is saying rather than um, too opinionated because we will have different opinions, but we have to allow the word of God to speak to us and let the word of God be our guide in understanding what God is trying to reveal to us through the scriptures. So I hope you have had a basic understanding. And of course, if you want to make contact with me after the sessions are completed, 
feel free to do that. Call me anytime and engage me on any um, of these areas. Sure, certainly beyond beyond a shabbat, though I'm willing to engage you in other studies because um, while this is, is my pet area and I have been doing some research on these eschatological perspective from mean of a generation ago and have been able to share them with the, the young people um, whom I would have been leading when I was the president of the National Youth Fellowship. I try as much as possible to look for, for topics that are challenging to the church and that people are, are questioning um, the authenticity and the reliability of the word based on these particular issues. So I've been doing a whole lot of studies um, for, for months on evolution and, and the creation debate because that is engaging a, a whole lot of people in these times. A lot of young people um, are being swayed when they go to universities by the saints. And we're told very often these days to trust the saints, but but a lot of saints can be misleading and, and can, can carry people down the wrong track. And we need to understand um, what the word is teaching in relation to these issues. And that is a very important area that we perhaps would need to look at in the future. I was thinking of engaging the younger people with that sort of study, those who are colleges and universities. But of course, the, the older folk can be part of that dialogue as well. Then we are, are, are constantly being engaged on the whole element of homosexuality. It's becoming prevalent in the church. It's becoming a mainstream um, sort of ideology in terms of, of people's sexual preferences. And there is a, a lot of study that needs to be done in relation to that as well. Whether it's natural, whether it's, it, it's God-ordained, whether people are born that way, um, or whether we have a misinterpretation, a misunderstanding of God's position on, on human sexuality and things of that nature. So that's another area of study that we could engage our, ourselves in as well. So, so there are, are things that are, are essential in us understanding the word and be able to defend our perspective and, and project the, the truth of the word um, to, to the nations. I, I listened to, to Peter Wickham's perspective on, on um, slavery, and he has a strong opposition to the Bible based on how he perceives the Bible views slavery. So as a result, I also engage in a whole other study on, on the Bible's position on slavery and comparing slavery in, in the Judaistic period to what we perceive and we have come to understand about slavery from our middle passage experience. And I think there's a lot of um, understanding that we need to, to get in relation to that to clarify perhaps the way people misrepresent the Bible in relation to that whole area of slavery. But a lot of people have put up strong opposition to the Bible because they think the Bible supports the type of slavery that um, was part of the heritage of our ancestors. But that is really not the case. So yes, there are a lot of areas and you might think of other areas that we need to engage ourselves in. So sure, I am open to further dialogue and discussion on some of these areas. But of course, my brain would need a little break because I can imagine what it was like for you. Now, I've been engaging these studies for years and it still felt like my head was so full of information. So I, I know that you'll be battling to try to retain all the things that have been taught. But, but there are basics that we, we, we have in terms of our theology and our position to the rapture, um, to the mark of the beast, to the tribulation, to the um, judgments, to the coming of Christ and what happens at the end. Those, those are some specific things that I think you can remember easily. I remember the theology um, and the supporting scriptural references um, that you know you can retain. Well, you might not understand the full discourse and, and, and dialogue and a whole lot of other passages that we might refer to. I think you, you could have a good understanding of our basic position in relation to those. All right, so tonight, tonight what we want to, to conclude our study on the Battle of Armageddon, and then we also want to look at our final consummation and have a, a discussion on, on heaven and hell, where we spend eternity. 
um, what we can look forward to in eternity, how will it all end? Um, and I know there are questions in people's mind as to the whole concept of where we spend eternity and what is that going to be like? What does the Bible say about it or not say about it? Because there are some details that I believe people speculate on that we do not have specific references in the Bible in relation to. But because of that uncertainty, people have come up with a variety of opinions on what is going to be like in, in eternity. So we would dialogue on a, a couple of issues and look at a few scripture references in relation to that. And that will conclude our, our whole theological perspective on end time events. And I'm going to miss the engagement really and truly. And I, I, I hope that the, the study would encourage you to do more study on your own and be as enthusiastic and zealous about the word as I am. I hope that, you know, that I have started a spark that will get a fur um, going and soon all those around can warm up in its glowing. And it's really a joy to study the word and to understand the depths of what God reveals to us through the word. And it's very, very engaging. And the more you read it, the more you learn and you come to understand things that, that you were a little um, gray or dark on. And so it's, it's an area that will constantly engage us and, and God will keep revealing to us as we search. Now, now, last week, I tried to give you a little background to the whole concept of Armageddon, where it, the, the word derived from, because we said it's not an actual place called Armageddon. But I explained to you um, the, the Hebrew Har Megiddo, which means the hill of Megiddo, which is an actual place in Palestine. And the reference is drawn from that because it was an area where major battles were fought. Um, engaging the people of God and there were also battles that did not engage the people of God that were fought really in that particular part of, of Israel. And when I say people of God, I mean specific reference to the Jewish uh, people. And I believe that in, in this revelation here that, that John has been given, Jesus is, is trying to show how he would have stood in defense of the, the Jews as his chosen people, and is a reminder that in spite of all the opposition and the battles that we face as his people now, the, the, the chosen, as, as Peter indicates, the, the new covenant um, believers who are the now Israel of God, spiritually speaking, seed of Abraham, God has assured us that the same way he defended his chosen people in the Old Testament, the Jews, and fought for them against all the nations that were trying to destroy them and eradicate them from all the face of the earth. That the same way we would face opposition as Christians, and he, and he told us that we would be hated by, by all nations for his name's sake. But we have been assured that Christ will stand by us because he promised that he would be with us always, even on the end of the earth, and he would defend us as well. So I think Revelations is trying to bring us to understanding that while we would go through trials and tribulations and we would fight spiritual battles and we look at scriptures also last week from the book of Ephesians and as well as Timothy and um, Corinthians which speak about, about engagement in spiritual warfare that we understand that it's a spiritual conflict and a spiritual battle that we are engaging. And as we pointed out all through our study, there is a lot of figurative language used in the Bible, especially when it comes to prophecy. Not only prophecy, but, but generally speaking, we cannot um, think that a literal interpretation of the Bible is the way we should approach the study of the word. There are things that are literal, but there's a lot that is figurative. And, and so we, we must recognize that we have to approach the study of, of the Bible in trying to understand language that is figurative and recognize that that type of language is used. And if we do not interpret it in that light, we could misrepresent the particular truth or teaching from the word. So we, we also concluded that the book of Revelations, and this is part of our theological position, 
gives a, an overview of the, the life of the church, the history of the church from the inception, from the time it was established by Christ until he returns and brings an end to all things and hands up the kingdom to, to, his, to his heavenly father. And, and so we, we must look at Revelation and with that understanding that some of the things that were mentioned would have been related to John's time that were actually happening in his time. Some of those things pointed out to John in Revelation were also things that were going to happen close to his time period. It was still future, but in, in close proximity to the time that he was living in his, in his uh, time period. But also he points down to the end of the age, the end of time when there will be a climax to all of the, the spiritual warfare that would engage God's people and engage the church and the assurance that God is going to fight for us to the very end. We saw in Revelation chapter 12, the introduction of the adversary and the pagan Roman system that sought to destroy the church. Remember Nero said that he would seek before he died to make sure that Christianity is eradicated from the face of the earth. He died and he, he's seen corruption and Christianity still stands today because the word has promised that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of God. And that's what Revelation is trying to assure us. The church will go through its struggles. Individuals as Christians will go through their struggle and persecution and testing and, and battles and struggles with the, with the evil one. And, and his alliances and all the forces that he is going to engage, whether it's false prophets, whether it's paganism, whether it's the world systems, all of these are things that um, we will have to wrestle against. It's not flesh and blood battle, even though sometimes it, 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 it would engage flesh and blood. But to a large measure, we are engaged in a spiritual war which the, the enemy is, is basically behind and he is forming all sorts of alliances to bring destruction to the church and to the kingdom of God but that will not happen and as long as we remain part of that kingdom we'll be part of the victorious strong that will be presented faultless to the father and we want to be part of, of that group that endures to the end because he that endures to the end the same shall be saved so while the word Armageddon was mentioned and it gives the impression that it's a literal battle and again, like the, the passage that we read in Revelation 20 referring to the millennium, it's, it's, it's a one reference um, term and therefore it's difficult to form a theology based on a one reference term because we have to have scriptural references that will help to support a particular perspective because scripture helps interpret scripture. So what, what has happened is that theologians who have formed the opinion based on their understanding that that is what they believe it is saying, they have tried to justify that position by pulling on other references in the Bible, like they would have done with the millennium, which when we examined, we saw that those were references referring to the kingdom of God in the, in the first advent of Christ being established at that time. But they were looking for support for that view of a literal millennium, and they were using those scriptures to apply to that literal millennium, which we believe was a misinterpretation. And so the same thing happens with the Battle of Armageddon. There is only one reference made to it here, Revelation 16, 16, and we do not see references in other parts of the, of the scriptures speaking specifically of this end time battle where um, a whole set of um, Gentile nations are going to combine forces and attack Jerusalem and Christ will be engaged in an actual physical battle which will involve um, a, a lot of bloodshed because they, they quote the reference um, from the Old Testament where they talk about the blood rising up to the bridle of the horses. Now if that is to be literal, you are talking about blood which is, is, is about two and a half feet to three feet um, rising from off the surface of the earth and that's a lot of that shed if you're thinking about it literally and do we see Christ as that sort of, of, of um, person who will be engaged in that sort of slaughter 
this and what he taught us about the nature of his kingdom. So we have to be careful of applying um, a, a literal interpretation to that and then looking for passages to justify it. And they pulled the passage from Ezekiel chapter 38, which mentions the, the Gog and Magog conflict. And they will also make reference to that from Revelation 20, because you see those terms also mentioned in Revelation 20, which we glance at where Satan, after he was loose for season, um, sought to, to, to get all the nations to come together to fight against um, God's people. And then they also look at Zechariah chapter 14, and we could just glance um, briefly at these references because we cannot go into them in detail. But you need to understand that, that, again, some of these references have historical applications, which means that, they're yes, they're referring to battles, they're referring to wars which engaged the children of Israel, the people of God, but they were part of um, historical events, whereas they might be looking for them to still occur in the future, like they were looking for things mentioned in Isaiah um, about the kingdom of God, to occur in the future because their argument was that they had not yet occurred. But sometimes um, we might miss historical um, applications which do show that the events have occurred in history and therefore we need not be looking for them in the future unless there is what we call the dual prophetic application, which as I told you before, we really cannot be sure of until it, it is on it, it unfold before us. Because if there's a dual application, we will have to wait for it to happen. We see reference in the his, historical account. And so if there's a dual application, which means that it can have a second application that could possibly occur in the future. And we said there is always that possibility, but we can't know until it, it happens. And if we are not there to witness it, then we would not know in reality that it has um, a, a second application to it. So you have to be wary of, of, of using that as an evidence for something to take place in the future. And that is in relation to, to, to things that we interpret in the Bible as literal. Our understanding and our perspective of it from the Church of God Reformation movement and the the theological perspective of those persons who support the amillennial position is that that reference to Armageddon is not meant to be a literal interpretation of a final battle which engage um, a, a war of weapons, a war of, 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 of um, mass armory. And obviously it cannot be the type that would have been mentioned in the Old Testament with swords and spears because we are live, living in a different era. Now, I indicated to you that Revelation 16 needs a, a, a proper um, understanding and interpretation since the passage occurs in, in, in that particular chapter. And so we attempted to look at it in, in greater detail. And we started last week and we read part of it and we want to complete the remaining section of it. Remember, I, I tried to indicate to you that what is happening here is that there is, there is an analogy being drawn with battles that were fought um, in the past at this same um, site called Megiddo, from which the term Armageddon is drawn. But as I indicated, Armageddon is not the name of an actual place that you would find. I think this is a, a sort of Greek um, reference to that Hebrew term that was used in, in the Old Testament, referring to the, the valley in Palestine called Megiddo. So I did indicate to you that Revelation 16 is just showing us um, symbolically the judgment that is going to come on all of those nations and, and, and people who have been in opposition to God's purpose and, and, and God's church. And the comparison is drawn with the fact that God has engaged on behalf of all those nations that tried to destroy the Jews, which was the, the Old Testament um, covenant group. And in, in the similar way, the New Testament covenant group, which is the church, will also find itself in strong 
um, battle against opposing forces. And so God is trying to show us that in the same way he judged Egypt, and that's why references are made to some of the plagues that happen in Egypt here. He judged Babylon, and references will be made to Babylon as well. That he will also judge all of those nations and all of those people that come up against the church or that oppose his purpose and his perspective for the world. So Revelation 16 is giving us um, a sort of insight into the final judgment that comes out of all the conflict that the church and the people of God and the kingdom of God has had to face over time. So we're going to pick up from um, verse 9. I think we finish at, at verse 8. And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, verse 9, and blasphemed the name of God, which have power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him glory. Now watch that very carefully. So in other words, judgment is coming as a result of rebellion against God. Remember, rebellion started in heaven in opposition to, 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 to worship to, to God. And that came from Satan. And, and Satan has been cast out. And Satan is the, the inspiration behind all the rebellion against God's church and God's people. He is the instigator and we will see in Revelation 16 and then go on to 17 and 18 and 19 how judgment flows to the false prophet, to, to um, all the pagan systems, as well as, as, the, as, the, as the devil in Revelation chapter 20. So it, it, it's, it's bringing and to end the conflict and the judgment that will occur as a result. So this chapter is just showing us in, in, in symbolic representation, as I said, now some of the things could, could actually happen in, uh, in, in, in some degree. But I believe the, the focus here is showing that God is going to bring judgment on all the, the, the people who oppose and who rebel against um, what he has been trying to establish and all of those who have been in, in strong opposition against the, the church. Now notice here that in spite of the judgment that is coming, yet people still rebel. The Bible says that it's the mercy of God, it's the goodness of God that leads men to repentance. Because even when judgment comes, people's heart get hardened. And rather than repent, they, 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 they begin to become more antagonistic. It's like Pharaoh. And that's where reference, where reference is being made back to Egypt. Because while God was judging Pharaoh for his oppression on the children of Israel, for the, on, the, on the Hebrews, Rather than repent, fear of heart became harder against God. It is, is the, in, the, in the arrogance and the pride, he resented the fact that God was bringing judgment on his nation because of his opposition to God's authority and God's sovereignty. So chapter 16 established from the beginning that God is sovereign over the earth and the sea and all that has been created. God is sovereign. A man in pride has lifted up himself like Satan because Satan is, is passing on the same nature that caused him to be cast out of heaven to the people on earth that they would rebel against God's system, against God's order, and, and against um, God's statutes. And what, what Revelation is showing us is that judgment will come on all of, of these opposing forces. Yes, people have been martyred. Yes, Christians have suffered. Yes, we will continue to suffer, but, but the word is hold on, do not give up because judgment is going to come on all these opposing forces and God will vindicate his people and we will come out triumphant and we will come out more than conquerors. And while people here are being judged, there is still rebellion in their heart. We move on to verse 11 and, and the, sorry, verse 10. And the fifth angel poured out the vial upon the sea of the beast and his kingdom was full of darkness and they gnawed their tongues for pain and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and repented not of their deeds. Watch it again. Being judged 
and not repenting. And there were times where the children of Israel were like that. And God told them that in the, in, in the, through the prophet Amos. He said he sent things to judge them because of the rebellion. He judged their land. He judged their, 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 their fields, their, their people. He afflicted them. And yet they, they continued not to repent. And he says, well, they're going to meet him. He said, prepare to meet God. And basically, in essence, it is, it is indicated here. They're, they're, the world is being judged for rebellion, but yet they're continuing to, to disobey and not to repent. And so they're going to have um, the final judgment that will be inflicted on them at the end of all things. And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, that the way of the kings of, of the east might be prepared. Now they interpret this to mean that, that God is going to literally dry up the river Euphrates to make a way for the kings of the east. He's referring to China and Russia to attack Jerusalem, attack the holy city. But notice as we go through the chapter and finish it, that you will notice that there's no reference made to any such specific conflict between these nations and the Jews or Jerusalem. That is their interpretation of it because they are, are, are having the understanding that the battle of Armageddon is going to be a battle fought by some of the Arab nations accompanied by the, the Chinese and the Russians. And that's how they interpret Ezekiel because the Gog and the Magog concept, they, they believe is making reference to the tribe that descended from Japheth, which lived in the place that is, is, is currently occupied by the Russians. So when, you, when we glance at Ezekiel chapter 38, you will see that he's making reference to the sons of, of Japheth. And, and the place where they live is where um, the, the interpreters of, of, of the Armageddon as a literal battle believe that that is an indication that that's where the conflict is going to come from. Russia joining alliance with China plus um, Iran and Syria and, and those areas to attack Jerusalem. But you will notice that there's no such mention here, even though the word Armageddon is mentioned, there's no specific reference to any of these nations um, coming against specific Jerusalem as mentioned. So it's an interpretation that is being superimposed on, on the passage. And I say that that's what we have to be weary of when we are interpreting scripture, try to, uh, to avoid superimposing the view, but look precisely at what the scripture is saying. And he said, And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon. See, the reference is being made to the dragon, to the beast, and to the people and nations that oppose um, God and oppose the kingdom and oppose the church. And this is really judgment is going to come out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles which go forth un unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Notice no specific reference um, to place and people. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked, and they see his shame. The great day, and behold, it come quickly. So we are, we are moving towards the end. And what God is, is showing us that all the, the opposing forces that we saw earlier in the Revelation, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet, the unholy alliance, the unholy trinity, which has over time been the opposing forces against the church, against God's people, and against um, God's kingdom, they are going to meet their final judgment and that's what the bible here is a us of and it's just using symbolically the, the concept of armageddon because it, it represented a place where a lot of battles were fought with god's people and 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 god defended um his people so he gathered them together into a place called which is called in the hebrew town armageddon and the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, it is done. It is done. It is all finished. It's complete. 
Now, the reference to the Euphrates River is, is going back to drawing reference to Babylon. Remember, what, what Jesus is showing John is the, the account of nations that have come up against the children of Israel and were defeated. Mention Egypt with reference to the plagues and the, the river Euphrates is mentioned in reference to Babylon because remember Isaiah had prophesied that Cyrus will be the one, the king of, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the Persians and the Medes um, would overtake Babylon and they would, would divert the Euphrates River. That's what actually happened. They dried up the waters of the Euphrates because the river Euphrates flowed through Babylon. That was that supplied the water. And, and also, they, they had their gates coming down right into the river that nobody can actually get in the city. So you would have to be able to remove the water and create a space underneath the gate to be able to get in the city. And that's precisely what happened. And that was actually prophesied. So, so Cyrus drove away the water the, from, the, from the river and created a space then between the, the iron gates that would have come right down to the, the bottom of the river and they were able to get into the city. And that's how Babylon um, was, 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 was overthrown. And so the reference is being drawn here. So Egypt destroyed, Babylon destroyed, so will the false prophet, the antichrist, the beast, the, um, the dragon, all of these forces that oppose Christ Christianity. And the great city was divided into three parts. And the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon, see, came in to remembrance before God to give her unto her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. That's the same Babylon system that was in strong opposition to the church. That system is going to get judged. And remember we read chapter 17, we saw the reference being made to the great harlot, the mother of abomination, the mystery Babylon. All of those were part of the pagan systems that were opposing to the church. All of those are going to, to, to be judged and brought to an end. And, and the reason why you would have to recognize that the language is, is, is not meant to be literal, because if you look back at the, the talk about the unclean spirits, like fowls that come out of the mouth of the dragon, and out of the beasts, and out of the false prophets. So are we saying that there were little frogs coming out of these mouths? No, it went on to say, for they are the spirit of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth. So it, it is even indicating to us that it is symbolic. It's not meant to be taken literal, but it is meant to show that they represent the evil that was coming from the false prophet, from the dragon, from uh, paganism, all of these forces were evil seeking to destroy the church but they're going to be judged by God and they will have their aim verse 20 and every island fled away and the mountains were not found, well, obviously that is not that is not literal and there fell upon men a great hail out of heaven Every stone about the weight of a talent. And although those will have to be some huge hail stones, if you're literally thinking about, about that. And hail does not normally fall like that. And the men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail. For the plague thereof was exceeding great. So you see, again, rebellion still coming, even in the face of, of judgment. Even in the face of the fact that God was pouring out his wrath on all of the opposing forces. That is the, that is the pride and the arrogance that, that comes from, from opposition um, to God. So chapter 16 doesn't give any specific reference to names of countries um, coming against Israel to engage in any battle. So the Battle of Armageddon, while it is drawn from this particular text to refer to a literal battle, they are pulling references from other places to substantiate that particular position because there's no specific indication here of any particular countries engaged in a literal conflict with the, with the Jews that Christ comes back and, and, and brings bloodshed and, and um, engage in a battle. Bring the, the saints that they believe would have been raptured from heaven back to be engaged in a fight with him. So, so Christians who have been been, been, been martyred and, and, or who would have died 
in Christ will have been resurrected, taken to heaven. Now, the end of all things should be eternal bliss, as the Bible has promised. Where are we going to the New Jerusalem and there's no more reaping and no more tears? But yet you are telling me that we, we are raptured and then we come back from a rapture experience to be engaged in a, in a blood conflict with nations that are opposing Jerusalem because you, you take that literally and, and we say um, no to that. Just let us glance at two of the passages that they have, they make a reference to, just to, to, to let you see um, passages that they are drawing to support their particular view because if you, if you don't find it in the particular reference and you, you want to build a theology of, from it, it means that you must have to find other biblical could support. So let's look at the passage in Zechariah, chapter 14, which they believe is, 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 is speaking of this particular war, this literal war that will take place at the end of the world. And after you look at these two passages, we'll pause to see if you have any questions, and then we will go in to look at the final um, thought on, on the end of all things and, and look at where we spent eternity. Zechariah chapter 14. And it says here in the first verse, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh. And usually when we see the day of the Lord, that is a reference to a judgment term. That's a judgment term. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, and the spoil shall be divided in the midst of thee. For I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle. See, this is where now they're pulling the reference to, to, uh, to align with the Armageddon concept. I will bring all nations against Jerusalem to battle and the city shall be taken and the houses rifled and the women ravished and half of the city shall go forth into captivity and the residue of the people shall not be cut off from the city. All right. Now, what does that remind you of? If you remember um, Matthew chapter 24, speaking of the Roman invasion of, of, um, of the Jews and the destruction of Jerusalem, there, there, there are many theologians that believe that this reference is, is referring to that particular uh, battle, bringing nations against Jerusalem, um, and that was in AD 70. So, so Zechariah was seeing that, and this is not a connection to the literal battle that they're talking about at the Battle of Armageddon, which is still to come at the end of, 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 of time. And there is even conflict in their particular theology because some say that the battle of Armageddon will take place after the tribulation. And some say the battle of Armageddon will take place after the millennium. So there is there's conflict there in, in relation to that theological perspective. And a prophecy does not work like that. Prophecy is very, very specific and it leaves no, no doubt. When Jesus prophesied about the destruction of Jerusalem, it was very, very specific. When, I, when Isaiah prophesied about the destruction of Babylon, it was very specific. When Jeremiah prophesied that the Jews would have been overtaken by, by Babylon and they'll be taken away to captivity for 70 years, it was very, very specific. And these prophecies were given several years before they actually happened. Because Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 44, 45, you can read those prophesying about, about Babylon being overtaken by Cyrus, the Medes and the Persians. He would have prophesied somewhere in the 8th century BC. And, and Cyrus came to power in about the 6th century BC. So you're talking about 200 years difference. And the prophecy was so specific and so accurate, leaving no guess at all. That's how prophecy unfolds once it comes directly from God. And the, the, there is here reference, if you look at the same things that were mentioned, the, the, the nations and why, why all nations because the Roman army was pulled from all the nations that made up the Roman Empire. So that's why the, the concept here, all nations, is referring to that um, battle that took place in AD 70, when the Romans came and invaded Jerusalem, ravaged the women, took the spoils, um, carried away some in captivity. Others were, 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 were kept as slaves. A lot of them were being killed. It is believed that that is what that prophecy is referring to. And then the one, sorry, talks about the same And then the one in Ezekiel chapter 38. Ezekiel 
It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Mesha and Tubal, and prophesy against them. And say, Thus saith the, the, the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, O Gog, chief prince of Mesha and, and Tubal. And I will turn thee back, and I will put hooks into thy jaw. Watch the language again. I will bring thee forth with thine army, horses and horsemen, all of them clothed with all sorts of armor, even a great company with bucklers and shields, and all of them hauling swords, now, as, as Brother John pointed out. Now watch that language. If you're thinking of a, of a battle of Armageddon, you're thinking about, about spears and swords, that sort of battle in a, in a final end of, of, of the age battle, with all nuclear armory and weapons. And, and that's why the concept of dread, the, refer, the, the river Euphrates for the kings of the east to pass over. You don't have to drop any river for people to cross to get to Jerusalem to, to fight. You, you dropping people by helicopters. You 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 landing soldiers by planes. Now you don't have to drop a river for people to cross. So so the idea of, of, of the battle being waged that the reference could not have been made to an entire battle and speaking in those particular terms. Persia, Ethiopia, and Libya, no specific places I mentioned here, all of them with shield and with helmet, Gomer and all his hands, the house of, of Targamath, of the north quarters, and all his bands and many people with thee. Be thou prepared and prepare for thyself, thou and all the company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. So, so yes, you see reference here made to a gathering of armies against um, what would appear to be the, 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 the Jews and the children of God. And, and they project this again to be reference to that battle of Armageddon. So they're pulling from Zechariah and they're pulling from Ezekiel to, to justify their interpretation that Revelation chapter 16, that battle of Armageddon, the literal battle. But notice was indicated, there's no specific reference to that type of battle in, in the passage where it occurs. And the only passage in the Bible where it occurs, and there's no reference to Jews fighting, and there's no reference to specific um, armies. This one, again, they believe is reference to, to Antiochus Epiphanes, who was the person that tried to destroy again um, the Jewish people, and that, that even went all down into Esther's time, where, where the, the Persians the, were actually trying to destroy um, the, the Jewish people as, as, as a nation. And Ezekiel is speaking again of, of that sort of conflict. So, yes, we are, we are speaking of conflict, we are speaking of battle, but we do not believe that these are, are speaking of, of battles to come in the future in a literal sense, which is, is a specific battle of Armageddon fought at the end of the world, which would engage um, nations coming against Jerusalem and Christ coming back to fight with his angels. And as I said, based on our holistic view of Christ's teaching and who he represents, we cannot conclude that, that the reference is to a literal battle. Yes, it's speaking of battle, but we believe it's speaking of a spiritual battle that will engage the church right to the very end. It started from the beginning with Satan and the dragon approaching the woman and Revelation is seeing it right through history, true to the end, where Christians are martyred, Christians are persecuted, Christians will suffer for righteousness um, and they will overcome by the blood of the Lamb of the word of the testimony, but we will overcome all the conflicts that oppose the church and try to destroy it. It will be triumphant in the end. The church triumphant will be saying the victory song. And when you go on to look at the other parts of Revelation, you will see the victory song being sung. All right, so I, I pause there. Any questions? Because the, what we will engage in now is not going to call for a lot, a lot of deep study because there are not a lot of biblical references in relation to um, where heaven is going to be and where we spend eternity. But there are some um, passages that we can extrapolate from to give us an idea of where eternity will be spent. Uh, we can engage ourselves in that dialogue. So any questions or any statements that anybody wants to make 
in relation to this battle. Um, a survey was carried out in the United States and it said that 44% of the people believe that there's going to be a battle of Armageddon, which they call the Third World War, that will happen that will bring the world to an end. Again, because it has been widely publicized by criminalists and there have been movies made, even entitled Armageddon, and so it, it has got into the mind of the people like the whole concept of the rapture. And so there are people who believe that, that there's going to be this literal battle. But, but we don't support that in our theological perspective. We believe that it's a reference to spiritual conflict, which has started from the first century and which will continue down till Christ's return. And this is just what John was showing the, the end of the conflict and the judgment that will be coming on all those opposing forces and the church will be finally triumphant. And then chapter 20 mentions then um, the, the, the actual destruction or putting away uh, sentencing of the of the devil, the dragon. But we mentioned the false prophet and the beast here. So any questions or comments or if you want to wait until we, we, we glance at the, the final section because Brother Spooner wanted to engage in, on this one so we want to give him some time to be able to engage. Uh, Rev. Sophia, yes. I believe, I believe Sophia Holder from Bournes. So mm -hmm. um, you can go ahead with your question or comment. Hi, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yes. I just wanted to ask a question. So based on all the conflict that is going on around the world at this time, yes, I'm not sure how familiar persons are with what's going on with China and Taiwan and then Australia and the U.S. and all of that. Where is, is anything like this mentioned? Any war or anything like that mentioned in the word or would that encompass what you, what is spoken in Matthew talking about wars and rumors of wars? Do you see this as something major that can happen? No. We, we, we did indicate that Matthew chapter 24 had direct and specific reference to what would have happened in AD 70. Jesus made that specific and the description that he used and in the context in which he used it, people fleeing from Judea to the mountains and, and, it, and it would be um, difficult for them if they have to flee in the Sabbath. Yes, we had enough references to indicate that that was re relating specifically and then Jesus said that the the people in that generation will witness all these things that were going to unfold. So the premillennials project um, Matthew chapter 24 into the future and believe that the things mentioned by Jesus are things that are still to happen. Now remember again, I, I spoke about the, the, the dual prophetic application. So yes, while we find that there's a specific reference to it in history, I do not rule out the fact that there's a possibility that some of the things mention a specific reference to the destruction of Jerusalem could have a parallel in the future before Christ returns. So just like the judgment that came on Jerusalem and there were signs pointing to what would happen before the actual judgment took place in AD 70 as specifically prophesied and came to pass, yes, it, you could have um, a parallel or a dual application of that prophecy which could relate to end time events like wars and rumors of wars and famine and diseases and pestilence because we are actually seeing some of these things happening in the world. So that's why I say I would not rule out um, the premillennial interpretation that some of these things could precede the coming of Christ in the future because you can have a dual application. So I, I will subscribe to that possibility. But the point I made, we have to wait for them to unfold before we can conclude then that there's a parallel because we already have the reference and we knew that it took place in history, but we have to see. Can we say that we are seeing some of these things? I believe definitely that we are seeing some of these things parallel because we're getting a lot of wars and there's this tremendous famine across the world. 
there's pestilences and we ain't, we ain't one right now. And the scientists are saying in the next five years, we could have another one. And the way things are going, uh, and if science continues to, 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 um, to experiment on viruses and do gain a functional research, God knows what could happen in the future as to viruses that could occur or plagues that can be devastated to human beings and, and, and mean in large numbers. And they indicate last week that we have had plagues that have caused the lives of thousands and thousands of people. So, so the numbers we're seeing now might be alarming, but there, there was this, the Spanish flu and, and then there, there, there was the, the, the Black Plague that caused the death of, of millions of people. So yes, I do not rule out the fact that there could be dual application and we could see some of these things um, as coming on our world because when the devil is loose for that season, I remember I indicated from our study that there's some theologians believe that we might be in that season now because we don't have a specific time, timing or length of time for that thousand year period. We said it's, a, it's, a, it's not an absolute number, but it's the number of years representing Christ's first advent and setting up his kingdom to the time when he returns. And since we do not know when he will return, we cannot calculate precisely how long that period would go because really and truly it has gone more than a thousand years already. And, and the fact is that we, we have had change in calendars and we, we cannot even predict what, 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 what time period we are in. There's a possibility that we could be in the period where the Bible describes as the devil has been loose for a season. And then we do not know how long the season is. It's not a literal season, which is three months. It, it could be mean a season which is shorter than the, the thousand year um, symbolic uh, period. It could be, who knows, 15, 20, 30, 40, but it's going to be much shorter than the period that would have been projected from Christ's time to the, his coming, which we are living in now. So yes, I would agree with you that we, we, we are going to see some conflict and, and we are seeing conflict with the Jews and with nations around them. Iran has been striking up um, against the, the Jews and we have seen um, a lot of Middle Eastern countries engage in conflict with the, with the Jewish people. So I believe that wars um, are, are going to be signaling the, the, the coming close to the time of Christ's return and, and the diseases and the, and the judgment on the earth like the who knows? We, we got global warming and hurricanes are becoming more destructive. We are seeing a whole lot of things unfold in nature that are devastating. So comparatively with what Revelation is saying, this could be of, of the signaling of the judgment that is coming upon the, the, the world for the rebellion against God. And we are part of it. That's why we do not believe that Christ will snatch us out um, of, of the world, that we will go through whatever the world goes through. But death is just a transition for us into the eternal kingdom. So if we die as a result of what we come, of what the world has to go through in terms of judgment, it, it, is, it is not anything that Christians would worry about because it's just a pathway to, to eternity with Christ. Thank you, Reverend Jackman. Yeah, sure. All right, we just move on. So that we can get in the final part here and we pick up from Revelation chapter 21. Okay, so 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 the world is judged. Antichrist, false prophet, dragon, beast, whatever term you want to use, all these opposing forces have met their judgment. And verse 11, pick up from verse 11 in chapter 20 says, And I saw a great white throne judgment, him that sat on it. From whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. Watch that carefully. There's, there's, there's constant reference to the earth and the heaven being removed. Peter also made reference to earth and heaven being removed. So take that into consideration when we are thinking where we spend eternity. And remember there's an argument that is put forward that we will spend eternity on the earth here. Peter made reference to the earth being destroyed. And here again, John is making reference. I remember this is not John speaking. This is a revelation given by Jesus to John. So Jesus is actually saying this or showing this, that the, the earth and the heavens fled away and there was no place found for them. And I saw the dead, small and great 
stand before God and, and the books were open. So this is a scene of the final judgment. And death and hell were cast into the lake. That's verse 14 of fire. This is the second death. Remember, we were talking about what is the second death? The second death is the eternal separation from God. That's the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That's the final judgment. So that, that's, the, that's the climax of the judgment that God brought against all the opposing forces. And this is their final sentence. They are put away. And then we are ushered in now to a new beginning. Verse chapter 21 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. Watch it again. Re repeated. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. All right, we are trying to understand where we spend eternity, what happens at the end of it all. So Revelation is giving us an indication, and you have to interpret this. And I John saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down. And this is this is the longest passage that you have given reference to where where eternity is spent and what is going to be like at the final consummation. This is the longest passage, but we will make some references and some shorter ones that will give us an idea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death. Neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Former things referring to the earth and, 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 the, and the heaven. And he that sat on the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, it is done. Watch that language again. It is done. It is finished. It is completed. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things. I will be his God. And he shall be my son. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and the whoremongers and the sorcerers and the idolaters and all the layers have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. You understand it again, the concept of the second death. All right, so I move on and to give a description of, of the holy city. And he carried me away on a great mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God and her light. Was like onto a stone most precious, even a jasper stone, clear as crystal, etc., etc., etc. So you're given a description here. All right, so that's an indication from John. Now you have to tell me how you understand John. But I take it to mean that what is being revealed to John is that we are going to spend eternity in a place that is created new. That that is my opposing view to the to the concept that we are going to spend eternity on a restored earth what some people's theological perspective is is that um god wants to give us an idea of what the restored earth was supposed to have been because we fell away from it from its edenic duty and and, and how it was created for mankind and so god is, is going to restore in other words the earth is not going to be a new brand it's going to be brand new it is going to be restored. That like you take a, a car and and you refurbish it and you spray paint it and you make it look brand new, but it is not a new brand. But what I'm saying here is that my understanding is that we are going to be someplace different from this earth. If the heavens and the earth pass away, now I, I I need to explain to you because of heaven. The Bible speaks of heaven in three different realms. There's the first heaven, the second heaven, and the third heaven. So, so when John or when Peter is seeing the heavens disappearing, he is referring to the first and the second heaven. The third heaven is where the glory of God is, where that's where God exists, that's outside of our universe. The first heaven is, is our atmosphere, that's where the birds fly, 
That's where we get our rain. That's where we have our clouds. That's where the planes fly. That's referred to as the first heaven, the atmospheric heaven. The second heaven is when you go to outer space where the stars and the planets are and the galaxies. That's our universe. That's the, referred to as the second heaven. I remember Paul talked about caught up into a different heaven. So he went, he went outside of, 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 our, of our atmosphere. And, 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 the, and the third heaven is believed to be the, uh, the place where is the abode of the glory of God. And I know that's, that's an immense expanse where man, man cannot get. As a matter of fact, man cannot even get outside of our, of, of our, our, our solar system to, to visit planets that are, are deep in the universe. He doesn't have the, 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 um, the, the machinery, the, the, sorry, the spacecraft or the time to be able to get to galaxies that are light like years away. I mean, even of our universe yet. So you can imagine the, the expanse of where we're talking about. Where, where, where God is. So when, when John sees the heavens remove, he is talking about the atmospheric heavens and the universe, not where, where God um, is supposed to, to, be, to be dwelling. So the belief is that, yes, mention is made of a new heaven and a new earth. So this is where people get the concept of, of us living on earth because the, the, the term is mentioned earth. There is not a different name given to it. But of course, God can prepare a, a different type of earth in a new universe. Because Jesus said in Matthew, in, sorry, in John 14, I go to prepare a place for you. If I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself. So if he's going to prepare a place for us, my understanding is it cannot be this earth because he's preparing that place. He has left the earth to go to prepare a place, which means that when we are caught up, as, as we are told in, in Thessalonians, to meet the Lord in the air and there we shall be forever with him, we are going somewhere. We are going to outer space, in another universe where a planet is created. Who knows? It could be looking like the earth, but we are reminded that there's going to be no sea, there's going to be no sun because the light of God's glory will be the light. There's not going to be any darkness. There's not going to be any time. Um, the former things that we are accustomed to will be no more. That's my concept and that's my understanding in a nutshell. Now, I want to spot, pause, and engage you. If you have a different perspective and you can support it with a scripture reference, you can do that. But my understanding is that eternity is not going to be on this earth because Christ has gone to prepare a place for us He's going to take us there. He said, I will come and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you will be also. Now, we don't have a specific. So I am, guess, uh, giving an opinion here, right? But I want you to, yes, to, to, to talk to me now. So I don't know, but the spooner is in and, and, and that um, gives him a different impression of... of, 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 of yeah, I'm very much here, but I, I want to go back on um, the scripture that you read earlier from yes. Zachariah. Zachariah. Yes. Zachariah uh, 14, verse 2. I will mm -hmm. gather all the nations to Jerusalem to fight yes. against yes. the city yes. to be captured, the houses mm -hmm. where I'm sacked, the women are raped, yes. and so on. Yes. But, but when you um, go when you fast forward now to um, the gospel, <laughs> according to uh, Luke, Mm -hmm. Jesus is quoted in Luke um, chapter is 21. Yes. 21, 20. When you see Jerusalem being surrounded by armies, mm -hmm. you will know that its desolation is near. Then yes. let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. And the mountains that he's talking about here is where is Africa, the land of Africa. Let those in the city get out and let mm -hmm. those in the country not enter the city. Yes. Now, if, if the people who are in Judea and um, all, of the, all of the country do as Jesus commanded them, how do these, the, um, how do you reconcile the, the, the prophecy from um, Zechariah? With the battle of Armageddon. Yeah. No, what I'm saying, the, the city itself, 
cannot fight. It needs people to fight. That's correct. But Jesus is telling them to flee. Uh -huh. And if they adhere to Jesus' warning, when Jerusalem, when the nation now surrounded Jerusalem, who will they be fighting against? All right, Brother Spooner, I don't know if you, if you were in for that session when we look at the, at the prophecy in Matthew chapter 24, because remember Matthew chapter 24, Mark 13, and Luke 21 are referenced to the same thing, that's the destruction of, of Jerusalem. And yes, Jesus did tell them that, and, 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 and many of the Christians had heard to what Jesus said, and they left Jerusalem, and they escaped. But many remain, because they, remember they, there were a lot of Jews there who were not Christians, and who will not have taken Christ seriously, they remain. And they, they went through a great slaughter. And, and many of them, and the history records that. And, and, um, and Josephus actually gives specific details as to the sort of, 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 of well, like a Holocaust that took place in Jerusalem, and thousands of people were slaughtered. And, and, and as, as it rightfully said, women ravished, and the, and the city was, 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 was raped, basically, of, 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 of um, it, it spoils as as Zechariah was making mention there. That was what was prophesied um, by Jesus. So it did it did happen, and people did escape from the city. I went to a place called Pila because they took Jesus seriously. Those were the Christians that took Jesus seriously and escaped. So those who I wanted to hear you by the school. I wanted to hear you on, on the point that we were discussing um, a few weeks ago about um, being Christians being uh, remaining on the earth for eternity. How do you see that in the light of what Revelations mentioned and what I, I mentioned in relation to what Jesus said? Um, any, a, any difference? Not, not really. I'm not, I, I, that is one that I still have to really do a lot of study on yeah yes okay because that, that is not something that you can just um get up over it and say well i believe this or i believe that All right. okay any other any other comments on relation to where we spend eternity I believe Fabian, Fabian has uh, a comment or query. Yes, Fabian. Yeah, sure. Um, well, two, I guess, queries, I guess you could put it that way. Um, you said that we see a mention of a new heaven and a new earth. Yes. Are we suggesting that Persons who have the idea of a multiverse theory might be that. May have, may have, there might be some truth to that. You mean the persons who believe that 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 right now we are we are in a multiverse? But the reason why they come up with that theory is because they cannot find any place in the in the, in, in our universe where you get the conditions that human beings can exist and that life can exist as it does on earth and that's that they don't have any proof of that that's their speculation because they're trying to, to, to justify the fact that um the universe evolved and it was not created and the bible made specific reference to the fact that the earth was created specially for mankind the earth in our universe mm -hmm. so the multiverse mm -hmm. concept is to try to, to, to get around the fact but hey, there, there might be other universes out there that do have conditions like the Earth, and there might be people out there living. No, that that is not a present reality because they can't prove it. That's a guess. It could be a, it, it could be a future reality, meaning that God, who creates all things, could create another universe. Because if this one is going to pass away, it is obvious that He would create another one. But it does not mean that there is no in existence other universes out there apart from the one that we are living in. If you understand what I'm saying, I get that. but the future, the future is that that's what God can do. But again, we we are we are speculating because um, the Bible does not say to us 
that God will create another universe and put an earth in it in a similar position that would be like the one that we have now, but it'd be a brand new earth. We, we don't know that. It said earth here because that's what we're dealing with. We don't even know what it would be called. See, so John, is, John is, is, is speaking in reference to what he's familiar with. New mm -hmm. heaven, new earth. But who, who knows what it would be called earth? It could be called by a different name. It could be. Well, the thing you know is going back to your question that you had um, approached with a spoon I with. Yes. Where the suggestion was that um, we would live in this future with the God um, in this new earth. And yeah. who's to say that, I mean, you said that the old earth, heaven and earth are passed away, but it could very well be that another situation where those who don't believe will remain forever separated from God. Okay. You, you, mean the fearful, you, mean, you mean the fearful and the abominable that are cast into the lake of fire? Correct. That they could remain on this, this old earth as their punishment? Correct. All right. That, 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 that is a thought. But again, it does not say where it, where it is. Right. It says they will cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, which is the second death. But we do not know where that lake would be. That that could also be a part in outer space that could be different from the earth that we are living on now as well. But again, we, we are speculating here because there, there are a lot of things we don't have specific reference to. Correct. Now, there's another thought which I want to introduce that we could dialogue on to. There, there are people who believe that the Christians will live forever in eternity, but the unsaved will be annihilated at some point in time that they will not spend an eternity in, 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 in punishment or in judgment. That, that the Adventists believe that view. And I, I guess there are some, there's some other Christians that might hold that position that, that God is, is too merciful to keep people in torment forever. And that at some point in time, they, they will be destroyed. Now, can anybody make a comment on that? And do we have any ver verses in scripture that might contradict that? Another verse I could read for you what you're thinking, 2 Peter 3, 13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwell of righteousness. So Peter was looking for that as well. I see um, Stephen Mitchell suggests 2 Peter 3, verse 10 to 13. I think you just mentioned that as well. Yes, right. I mentioned that. But Rev, the, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they believe that the, the earth is going to be purified and, and that we are going to inhabit the earth. Um, that is part of, of their, their, their teaching and thinking. And um, like you said, in relation to the Adventists, they are also of the opinion that God is too, too good and too loving to, to destroy people and cast them um, into hell and so on. Um, would you would you care to to, to expand? Well, the, again, the the, the Jehovah says, "Quote one verse to support that view: the meek shall inherit the earth." Correct. <laughs> but it didn't say the meek shall inherit the earth in eternity. It, I believe what that is speaking about is is um what will happen as in the terms of the character of those persons while they are on this earth, right? they will reap a lot of benefit and inheritance as a result of the, the quality of the life because the, the meat is referring to the character and the quality of the life that you are living. And I, I believe that that was referring to, to our present time. I don't believe that that was referring to eternity, but they concluded that it was referring to eternity. And then that's just one verse. And they conclude that the meat will inherit the earth. Well, we have other teachings, so many other parts of the scripture which indicate that a new heaven and a new earth is going to be created for for those persons um, who go. And as a matter of fact, what they believe is that the 144,000 are the only ones that will be taken to the to heaven. All the rest of people will be living on earth. You see, again, but that, that theology that is not based 
on, on actual scripture reference that's based on an, an interpretation that you superimpose on the passage. Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. And, and 144,000 can be the number that, that when the Bible says that the number that was, that was, that John saw that was going away to, to eternal glory was a number that you could not count. So then he, again, that would be denied if the, the, the fact that 144,000 are the ones that we go to heaven because the, the number is a number that, that you, you could not, you could not count. So, so that will show that that, that cannot be the case. There's a verse I want to read in relation to the, the concept of, of people um, not going through eternal punishment. Mark chapter 9, verse 43 says, If they hand offend thee, cut it off. And me, that's not literal. For it is better for thee, this is Jesus speaking, to enter into life maim than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. That's a statement made by Jesus. The fire that never shall be quenched. And he moved on to, to mention in verse 48, in the same passage, where the worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched, repeated twice. So if, if that is the case, now we're not talking about necessarily literal fire here. We're talking about punishment. We're talking about your, your, your final fate. And if, if they, they are going into the lake of fire, which is the second death, which is complete separation from God, and Jesus is saying the fire is not quenched. It means then that you will have to endure that punishment throughout eternity. And I, I, I'm going to ask the question again. Why are you going to resurrect people from the grave? Then to destroy them again. If the, if the punishment is not an eternal punishment. Because remember, when Christ comes back, there's a resurrection. All of the dead will be resurrected. That's the unsaved and the saved. So you're going to resurrect the dead, the unsaved, and then you're just going to judge them, and then you're going to annihilate them because they're not to spend eternity in everlasting punishment. But I don't, again, understand the rationale for that, but then I don't understand fully the mind of God. But to me, I don't think that that is the indication of the scripture. But there are people who believe that God will not have people in eternal punishment. Yes, yes Reverend John. Man. Yes. Yeah, no. You quoted from, you know, I, I always found Revelation 21. It, it seems to me like when you compare that with John 14, when Jesus said it going to be prepare a place for you. Yes. If the right interpretation is not applied or you don't fully understand it, it would seem like there's a conflict when you try to bring the two scriptures together. Uh -huh. But I, I lean on the fact that Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you. Yeah. I am going to come again and receive you unto myself. Yeah. Now, I was looking at Revelation chapter 7. Then you were talking about the 144,000. Mm -hmm. And then after that, verse 9 said, And I saw a load of written of the two. Yes. Which no mark a number. A number. From all things, great tongue. And languages and everything. Yeah. Yep. Now, it, was this activity taking place in heaven? Because there were, the Bible said there were around the Lamb's throne and they were worshipping the Lamb. And the mm -hmm. question was asked, who are these people? Right. Are these people, and it was said there, they are those who came to great tribulation. Great tribulation. Uh -huh. And, and washed in the blood of the Lamb. Blood of the Lamb. So, so they are Christians. It seems to me that this activity you know, is taking place in that new home. Yeah. And there are Christians. You're dealing with Christians here who have come through great tribulation and have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb, made them with the blood of the Lamb. They're speaking of, they're speaking of Christians. So to me, that, that is also a reflection on eternity. So the number can't be 144,000 because that's a specific number that was counted. And then John came back. That, that's why he said that's, that number is a symbolic number. Relating to something different, but they apply that to a group of people who are going to be in heaven. But but they can't prove that from that context. And and the and the key reference there is the one you just read. That 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 throne with a number that you can mention that have come through great tribulation and wash their robes in the blood of the Lamb. All right, and saying it saying that this is the final night on this particular session. You know we can we we will engage you for a little more time. 
But yeah, it I even agree with Ronnie. It even said that they were more numberless than the sand on the sea. All right. Okay. I tried coming in the sand on the sea. All right. So there's a go there's going to be a large horse. So then that defeats the argument that there's only 144,000 people going to heaven. Certainly not. I'm curious to see how such a large number of persons, I mean, notwithstanding those who would be going to this new earth, all mm -hmm. those persons who would have been resurrected um, to experience a second death, all staying on this earth. If we can barely accommodate the 7 billion we have now, if we have mm -hmm. trillion now in the future, that might very well be considered a hell. So, so you are saying they, that you believe that um, the unsaved are going to be kept someplace different than from from this earth? Or you I'm are you? Saying, I'm just huh? following the logic of that of that um, theory. If you're saying that persons are going to be stranded on the old earth in under under one presumption of what the end times would be. Um, you may have trillions of persons on the earth as it is now. Whether they, it turns out that this earth becomes um, the liter a literal day of fire or not. But if they were just living, having to live on this earth as you said, separated from God, that might that might be a fit that's very, very bad. That's just all I'm saying on that, on that front. Yeah, and I, I don't even know if you could conclude that that they will they will stay on this earth. Because remember, um, the scripture also said that God did not spare the angel that sin. But he, he kept them reserved and out of darkness, waiting until their final punishment. So they are kept somewhere, they're outer darkness. Where is that? That could be some place in space, some some part that may be different from this earth. So, so it means then that there's a, there's a possibility that there is a place reserved for those persons outside of the realm of this earth, because if the earth is going to be forever, he, if John said that the, the 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 heavens and the earth will pass away, um, and if Peter said that, I believe that it is going to be a different place for both the unsaved and for their sentence. And both for the Christians for their reward. I believe it's going to be all things made new, meaning that there's a different universe altogether. It's a different place that has been prepared. That's my understanding of it. Now, a lot of people don't they engage their minds on it, and I don't think really and truly that you know it's something that we should really worry about. Because as people say, wherever Christ is, I want to be there. And and that is the is the glory and the beauty of of the reward that you'll get to be in the presence of Christ wherever he is. If it's, it's on the earth renewed, or if it's in a, in a brand new earth made and designed in, 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 in another universe, in another part of, of, of God's creative um, system, well, so be it. Because uh, there are a lot of things we don't understand. We don't know what we will do in heaven. We don't know what it'll be like. That That is information that God has kept reserved for us. I guess the, the beauty is is thinking about it, wondering about what it would be like. That that would engage our minds. We just get little hints of the fact that it's going to be a beautiful place. Um, there will be no, we we got some conditions. We're not given a marriage. Um, and and because Jesus says those that aspire after the resurrection, he said in Luke, are not given a marriage. So we know that we're not going to be living normal human lives like we are living now. We we, we are having, we are given a marriage, and we're having relationship, um, having children. We know that there's not going to be any sun because the light of God's glory will be the light. There's not going to be any darkness. It's, it's going to be complete there all the time. And there's no there's going to be no time. So we we'll work out time, 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, 8 o'clock. All of that is, 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 is going to be irrelevant because we are in eternity. And so it's, it's an amazing world to behold. And God has kept a lot of it from our um, knowledge just to imagine I think that that's the excitement of it. When you when you are imagining what something could be like, it, it is a lot more excitement than something even um, if you knew what it was going to be like. And I believe that that might be deliberately why God would have reserved specific details as to what we're going to do in heaven, how we're going to spend eternity, 
what it's going to be like, but we, we got some indication of some of these things. We shall be like angels. People ask if, if they're going to be animals in heaven, if we're going to know um, our loved ones in heaven, if we're going to remember anything of the past. Um, if we are in heaven and, and our loved ones are in hell, if we, if we would um, have regrets and sorrow, but the Bible says all tears shall be wiped away from our eyes and there shall be no more sorrow, which means that we can't be sorrowing for our lost um, um, loved ones. So yes, we have some little specific details about the what heaven is going to be like, but there's there, there's a lot more the half has never yet been told that we can't um, begin to comprehend what it's going to be like. But it's going to be a, a marvelous place which everybody will want to aspire to. And whether uh, or not um, people um, comprehend what, what is going to happen in hell, because people say heaven is going to be born. Like if, if, if to live righteous and, and to live in God's favor is something that is born. And they would rather be in hell because they figure that, that, that hell is a place where you've got freedom to live your own life and do, or do as you please. You are going to be so much torment that you can't think about any, any pleasure or anything so in hell. Because I, I don't know, imagine what people can think. But if you read the story with Davies and Lazarus, you could see that, that, that Davies already had a taste of the torment. And he was not in the final um, eternal place nor was Lazarus in the final place. He was in, in, the, in paradise, which was a little precursor, or a little glimpse of what the, the glory of heaven is going to be like, but he was not in the final place. And, and so it's going to be a place of torment. So people who go to, who, who think that hell is going to be a place where you want to do as you like and, and that heaven will be born because you still have to live by rules and laws, they've got another thing coming. It's going to be a marvelous, glorious place. And I want to be there and I would encourage all of us to live lives that, that we would be part of that heavenly throne that will inherit that place wherever it is because Jesus is going to be there and we'll be rewarded with eternal bliss one other question for you yes um, I mean we've said over the last cu couple of weeks that mm -hmm. revelation is filled with figurative language that needs to be interpreted. That's right. Should we then take the whole of Revelation 21 literally? We mean with the new heaven and the new earth? Yes. And and there shall be no more sorrow nor no more crying no more weeping. As, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, there there were some people who wanted to, to um to, to to use that to symbolically represent the change over from the old covenant to the new covenant. And that when Jerusalem was destroyed, that was the, 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 the old um, system that was being destroyed. And what John was seeing here was the new covenant that was being introduced and the new bride representing the church um, as distinct from the old covenant Jews which rejected Christ. That's how they symbolically represented that. But remember, while we say that a lot of revelation is symbolic, not, not all of it is. Because it, it started out with some specific references to churches that existed and churches that got direct information um, from, from John, well, from, from Jesus through John, and specific indication as to his evaluation of them and the things that he found worthy of them and the things that he found that they had to change. So that was specific. And there are specific references to Christ and his nature and and to his power, those are specific. Um, so not everything in Revelation is symbolic. The, the, a lot of it, the language used is symbolic, but there are things that are Revelation that we, that we can take as literal and as specific. And I believe that this particular vision that John is seeing is a, is a glimpse of what the end is going to be like. And I, I believe we can take that one to be literal. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, a new order. There's going to be a judgment. That's what Revelation 20 ended off with. There's a judgment and there's a sentence. So we can't take that as symbolic because we have a lot of other references in the Bible which speaks of heaven, which speak of heaven and hell, which speak of judgment, which speak of eternity. And I think John was just giving us a final glimpse in the end of, of the, the book as to the glory that waits for those who serve Christ and the judgment and sentence 
that are where it's those who reject um, Christ. Same thing Jesus did in Matthew chapter 25. Gave us a, a glimpse of, of what eternity is going to be like. So I believe that particular part is, is, is um, a specific reference to something that would actually occur. All right, since we are we are on the on the last lap, we give we give you to 930. So that's an extended half of an hour. So we still have five minutes for some questions or some comments. But it's this is an interesting area. But as I say, we, we need not um, get ourselves too tangled with it because there's a lot that is not said, and we really have to be careful of of speculating on what is not said. Because remember, it's important when we're doing a proper exegesis, we look at what is said, but we also pay attention to what is not said. And if it is not said, then we are offering an opinion or an extrapolation, which could be right, but it also could be wrong. So we try as much as possible to stay with what we have. And there are some things that we have there in, in John that we can work with and other parts of the New Testament that we can work with in relation to eternity and to the end of all things. And we work with that. The rest is in God's hand. And we wait with eager anticipation and excitement to see it all unfold. Good night, Reverend Jackman. Yes. Um, on, on, on the question of where we will spend eternity, mm -hmm. uh, Jesus made reference to what is this here? I, I go to prepare a mansion for you. Yes. And how, how, how is that in conflict with the fact that um, the Re Revelation speaks of a make a new heaven and a new earth? Uh huh. Is there a conflict between the two? Or is that. Um, the, the the reference to a mansion is that also uh, figurative language? That that could be figurative language, but I don't think there'll be any conflict because Jesus says, "I go to prepare," and John said, "I saw, I saw a new heaven and a new earth coming down. It was prepared, adorned as as a as a as a, as a, as a, um, a bride for a husband." So, so the place that Christ has gone to prepare it has been completed. It is done. It is, it is completed. And, and, and he is showing John a glimpse of it coming down to take the, the place of what has been removed. Because even Isaiah prophesied that the earth shall reel to and fro and it shall, shall, shall disappear. It shall be no more. It shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. That, that was the language he used. So I don't I don't think there's any conflict and the the, 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 the idea of mansions might, might, be, might, might be symbolic in a sense but the, the place that has been prepared is is very specific very direct and I believe that it, it, it basically completed just waiting now for the final consummation of all things and we receiving our reward but again because it, it, it can't take Christ in eternity to prepare it because God created the whole universe in six days. Yeah. So so I believe that that, that place has been prepared already. So this idea of um, Christians or the safe will have a mansion right. in heaven that is um, would you say that's false? Or? So mansion meaning a dwelling place that you have your, your little castles living that's how you see in it. That's um, I guess how a lot of people um, <laughs> see it. Well, I, 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 again, I don't know um, what it'd be like because it does not give us a specific reference. It just mentioned um, a specific indication of of ownership of things. Um, so I, I, I really can't, as I say, speculate on on what. It would be like how how did how living would be conducted in heaven? Is it, 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 well? Somebody said there, there are two things that that make life what what it ought to be: love and work. And 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 the person was concluding this is a philosopher that that's what has to be in heaven. There's love and work. So in heaven you you're going to have work, 
and 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 he sees it's going to be a normal living like how you would have been living in the earth with responsibilities and work and duties just um in a way different but again it's based on speculation because we don't have any details as to how heaven is going to be managed through eternity and i i really cannot begin to understand how you are going to live through eternity and what it's going to be like because as i said there's no there's no concept of time last week and last month and yesterday and tomorrow and because those are those are conditions for our time we, we live in a time world because there's a limited amount of time for our existence so we live in in the time reference space but in eternity now you know like it's like god don't 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 time doesn't matter is it said a thousand years then god's sight is like a day and it is like a thousand years and that's what eternity is going to be like for us so we that now, I don't think it'll make a difference because we will be changed. We will be changed. Right. We will be changed. It's more our, our old minds. More who they is. So I, I don't think we become, we, 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 we have a time span because you'll be, you'll be a different being. We will be like the angels. Yeah, you're going to be a different being. Time won't matter. It'll be, it be just so, a perfect existence in the presence of God. I, I know people speculate because people thought we'd be singing in the, the heavenly choir and we'd be around the throne and all of that and we'll be meeting a greeting Peter and Paul and I, I don't know how you will know Peter and Paul because you don't know what they look like. Um, and, 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 people, and people wonder about those things. Um, uh, how, how, how will heaven be managed? But, but really our mind cannot comprehend that and I really don't try to get my mind engaged in that. It will blow your mind because our minds are finite and, and things can only be understood in the realm of our finite mind now but when we get to heaven we are going to have a, a, a whole different as randy is saying a, a complete design and so things are not going to to, to, to to relate to us in the way that they relate to us now but those are questions that people ask you shall be known as you are known you will recognize um, your loved ones and things like that. So if if you recognize your loved ones, it means that you would you would have memories of the past, memories of your relationship with your wife and, and the children. If they make it to heaven and things like that, those those are things that people try to figure out. But the Bible does not give us specific details as 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 to how things will unfold in that realm. We just have to wait to see what happens. A yes, lot so of it will be speculation. So we should just look at it as um, a dwelling place that uh, yeah, a, a, dwell, a dwelling place. Yeah, a dwelling place. Uh, Robert Chapman, I think um, I think persons should stop thinking physical and yeah. remember that. We will be spirit beings. Uh, flesh and blood cannot be yeah, heaven. We will be spirit beings. So a person must stop thinking physical. Yeah, that's true, Brother Spooner, because we can't understand it in the physical. Because oh. you see, we're trying to rationalize and figure out things with the, with the type of mind that we have now, which it be different. We shall be changed. The corruptible shall put on incorruption. The mortal shall put on immortality. We shall be like him. In, in essence, really, it's a completely different creation. Some people ask if you're going to wear clothes or, 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 or things like that. But again, right. But, but I suppose you said people are thinking in the physical. And I, I believe really we should, should, should not try to engage our minds in that just meet the conditions that we can spend eternity with Christ in heaven, knowing that that is, is, is a reward and that we escape a judgment which is um, e eternal separation from God, which is a place of torment. And nobody wants to be in torment for eternity. That is an awful sentence. And the same way God can blot out our sins and remember them no more. I really don't think that God is 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 a soft type of personality that be wondering 
um, what is happening to those people that are in torment for eternity or not. Because they had a chance and they rejected. You see what Revelation 16 was showing? That even in the judgment, they said blaspheme against God. So that, that's the nature of rebellious people. So you're going to have to share the faith that, 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 that comes to those people who have rejected God. All right, so we've gone past 9.30. I think we have given the extra half an hour for your engagement. And thank you very much for that. Um, as I said, I will stay at 10 o'clock if you wanted to, but you know, we have to be temperate in all things. And um, you have been given an extra grace period, and I appreciate the fact that we have engaged. And these are things that we can still give some thought to. And, you know, and engage in, in our own groups on dialogue. Um, to get better understanding of these things, but but a lot of them are going to be way past our understanding. I don't think that we need to, to, to bother our minds physically about trying to comprehend what heaven is going to be like because that's in the mind of God and, and that is past our finding out. That's that's the truth. It just look for the excitement of it, of being there and, and the joy that we will have in, in eternal bliss. So thank you very much and we look forward to a special edition. Don't miss it. We're going to be looking at the timeline for, for the birth of Christ and the timeline for um, the crucifixion. and see what the Bible says in reference to those specifics. And we see what details we get about the timing for Christ's crucifixion and resurrection and, and his birth.